Welcome back, fellow sojourners, to Appropriate the Culture. If you've been with us this far, you might find yourself discouraged, dismayed, or disheartened by the state of our culture and the church's inept response to it. But as one of my favorite demotivator posters says, it's always darkest right before it goes pitch black. And if you can't laugh your way through the apocalypse, when can you? But never fear, turn those frowns upside down because today's topic is all about opportunity. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your guru today as we appropriate some culture. So the argument thus far is that Christians and churches should be engaged in the arts because music, movies, and television are the primary drivers of the culture, and the cultural milieu greatly impacts the receptivity of the gospel. If we're discontented with the current culture milieu, as we should be, and if we want to stop using terrible French words like milieu, then Christians need to start making music, movies, and television. But we're not very good at that, particularly movies, for a myriad of reasons, such as a history of antagonism a misunderstanding of scripture, bad consumers making for bad producers, and a failure to recognize the audience and speak their language, which we covered all of those in previous episodes. If you missed those, you can go back and watch them. We'll wait. No, we won't. We have too much to do, and this episode is all about opportunity. As Paul says in Ephesians... Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We are living in a time of great opportunity for Christian art for a couple of reasons. As we talked about last week, a problem of Christian film is that it fails to recognize its audience and seeks to tell the exhaustive truth regardless of whether or not the audience is ready to bear it. Because the message is everything to us, we can't have you missing the message, and so our movies become the equivalent of shouting in your face through a bullhorn at point-blank range. But Christians are not the only ones who are susceptible to this pitfall. In addition to suffering from starvation, disease, and extreme poverty, North Koreans also have to endure North Korean films, which, like most Christian films, are hollow propaganda pieces obsessed with a message and therefore devoid of artistic merit. The late Kim Jong-il loved movies and hated North Korean films and hated them so much that he sought to rectify it by writing a book on the art of cinema and even kidnapped a South Korean director and his movie star wife and forced them to make movies for him. That's messed up. But it leads us to our new segment, Kim's Corner. Only realistic works of literature and art, which provide a vivid and profound portrayal of real life, can touch the hearts of people. It's hard to tell truthful stories when your entire society is pretending to revere Mr. Toad, but Kim Jong-il at least rightly recognizes that art and entertainment are powerful things that can shape a culture. But he also comes to realize, through the terribleness of North Korean film, that effective cinema needs to be more than just about the message. And hopefully that's a lesson we can learn without tormenting, torturing, and subjugating millions of people. And now a word from our sponsor. Appropriating the Culture is brought to you by communism. Wait, what? Communism, wasn't that the early church? No, you're thinking of altruism. When we divided a nation in half, communism is the one without electricity. When we divided a city in half, the communist side was the one that people tried to flee from. If you wanted to test an ideology, dividing a nation or city in half doesn't get much more scientific than that. Communism literally fails wherever it's tried, but maybe this time it'll work. Alrighty, so dirty, rotten, stinking pinko communists are not the only ones making terrible movies by abandoning all subtlety, nuance, discovery, or ambiguity in favor of the message. Hollywood, too, is getting in on the action. The movie industry has shifted to be more concerned with how it's made rather than what is made. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences' recent diversity initiatives changed its membership roles after too few Oscar nominees were black. 
But that wasn't enough. No, new Oscar standards were applied so that Best Picture contenders must be inclusive in order to compete. In order for a film to be eligible for Best Picture, a film must meet at least two standards across four categories. On-screen representation, themes, and narratives. So for instance, at least one of the lead actors or significant supporting actors needs to be from an underrepresented racial or ethnic group or at least 30% of all actors in secondary or more minor roles need to be from certain underrepresented groups, or the main storyline, theme, or narrative needs to be centered on an underrepresented group. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about high art, I naturally think of quotas and pre-approved subject matter. Hollywood has fallen into the same trap. The message is everything, and it's reduced modern film to wacko wokesters shouting slogans at us through a bullhorn. They're garbage films, just hollow propaganda pieces like North Korean films, or like most Christian films. But therein lies the opportunity for us, because most people just want good storytelling. And increasingly, Hollywood is incapable of doing that as it goes more and more woke. It's either vacuous comic book schlock for the 400th millionth time, or the latest intersectional Mad Lib where every picture is about a vegan, black, trans, queer woman who fights for social justice and destroys systemic oppression by overthrowing the patriarchy through the power of her lived experience. Of course, the main character will have to be played by a real vegan, black, trans, queer woman because acting is forbidden to the woke. And if you think I'm joking about that, you haven't been paying attention. Those films haven't been recast, but they have been canceled, probably because it's hard to find a vegan, black, trans, queer woman who's also really good at acting. The net effect of that is going to be worse acting, worse films, in service to the woke. And there's the opportunity for us to be better storytellers and filmmakers than what's in the market. And Christians are capable of this. You know what the best news satire is in the market right now? It's the Babylon Bee. Babylon Bee. No qualifiers. The Babylon Bee is the gold standard. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you reposted something from The Onion? The news satire site that makes waves in our culture is The Bee. And it does that simply by making jokes. It pokes fun at Christians and atheists and Republicans and Democrats. It's trying to be funny. Now, it is coming from a Christian perspective, yes, but it's far more liberated than the ideological bondage of the wokesters. The Onion, The Daily Show, Samantha Bee, John Oliver, and countless others are far more interested in adhering to an ideology than telling a joke. And the most important thing about satire is not the ideology, but whether or not it's funny. Now, I've never seen a joke convert someone to Christianity. If it has, we should probably be telling that joke more often. Uh, no, jokes are not good conversion tools, and neither are movies. But what they can do is affect the culture. There are, there are prejudices, there are preconceived ideas, there are people who are hardened to Christianity. Christians are prudes. Christians are boring. Christians are stick in the muds. And then maybe they get exposed to the bee and they think, hmm, I didn't think Christians could be funny. That's a small thought and no one's gonna be converted by it. But if they have that thought, aren't they more, even if only slightly, aren't they more receptive to the gospel? Because that's how influence in the culture works. Movies and televisions, they have perspective, but art nudges and woos, it doesn't ravish. If we learn this lesson, Christians can become the gold standard when it comes to filmmaking, and there's never been a better time because of the cost of entry. Provided the story you're telling doesn't require a bunch of special effects, stunts, or CGI, the cost of making a feature film, thanks to the digital revolution, has never been cheaper. The quality you can get matched with the cost efficiency eliminates a big barrier to entry. Heck, an entire film was shot using an iPhone 5S. It wasn't any good, but the point is, many digital cameras are capable of producing decent or even comparable video quality to what is being produced by the major studios. And even before the digital revolution, micro-budget films were possible if you were smart about it. Primer cost 7,000, Following cost 6,000, Paranormal Activity cost 15,000. And not only is the quality and cost manageable to make a film, but distribution is as well. 
theaters are dying. And, it, it, and it's not just because of COVID, though that accelerated things. Warner Brothers recently made a deal to release its slate of movies day and date with its theatrical release on HBO Max. And that's the future. That's going to be the norm. Because as much as we're nostalgic for the movie theater, we don't really like sitting in a dark room with a bunch of strangers who are talking, chomping on popcorn, making out, or being obnoxious when we have a great home theater. We all have giant 4K televisions with surround sound. We can pause and use the restroom and not miss a thing. Our floors aren't sticky. Our concessions are much cheaper. And no one is going to throw you out of the theater when your spouse is playing games on her phone. She can play any game she wants during the film and glance up occasionally and be like, what's going on? And you're like, this is a visual medium. Maybe you should watch it. And she's like, I was watching. And you're like, I want a divorce. And she's like, fat chance. I've said too much. The point is, the distribution models for big studio movies and small budget independent films are going to reach viewers in exactly the same way, through streaming and digital distribution. Theaters only have so many screens, and good luck trying to get on one of those. But streaming and digital distribution has no such limitations, and so for producers, this presents a much more level playing field, and that is, an opportunity for Christians to influence the culture. Well, don't forget to leave your questions or comments like this one from Norma Simmons, who writes, Dat Jin In. Norma, I think you had a stroke. Hope she's okay. Alicia Walters writes, Vat In In. Huh. Never thought of it that way before. Dang. Alicia, you're blowing my mind right now. I think I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. Well, keep those comments coming on the usual media platforms, whether you're a bot or not. And I'll see you back here again next week to appropriate some culture. <laughs>